Good evening. My name is Roxanne Chabot from RBC Consultants. Welcome to another International Dermatology Education Foundation Educational Series webinar. This evening, we are going to be talking about a topical treatment option for plaque psoriasis. Our moderator this evening is Dr. Faraz Ujir, who is Clinical Assistant Professor, Department of Internal Medicine at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine and President of Southeast Dermatology Specialist. Our speaker this evening is Dr. Linda Steingold, who is a board-certified dermatologist, Director of Clinical Research at the Henry Ford Health System. We would like to thank our supporter, Arcutis, for making this educational event possible. Before we begin, a couple of logistic tips. If you're having issues hearing the webinar, you can listen to the presentation using your telephone. Just select phone call in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. If you're having technical issues or if you would like to add a question to our faculty, please submit your questions in the question chat pane on the right-hand side of your screen. At the end of this webinar, a survey will pop up in your browser and will be emailed to you one to two days later. We'd greatly appreciate it if you could fill it in and send it back to us. Finally, within one to two days of the webinar, our certificate of attendance will be emailed to you. Again, if you want to submit questions to our faculty, just use the question chat pane on the right-hand side of your screen, and I wrote a little note there for you so you could see where you need to type in your question. And without further ado, I will pass the floor virtually to Dr. Ogier. Thank you, Roxanne. Thank you for um, having me, and thanks for everybody to be uh, for being on um, on this webinar. That will be very interesting. Um, I I wanted to um, introduce to you guys, if you guys don't know it already, and uh, the International Dermatology Education Foundation which uh, is uh, crucial in bringing this to us. This is a nonprofit organization founded by Dr. Leon Kursik, who is its president. And the principal mission of the International Education Foundation is to raise awareness and improve dermatologic care all over the world through education, especially in underserved areas. Uh, so it is with pleasure that the IDEF has done multiple educational sessions. Many of you guys have attended this, and, and so have I, with many illustrious speakers uh, over the last several years. Tonight, we uh, will be hearing and listening to Dr. Linda Steingold. Uh, Dr. Steingold is board certified um, in dermatology and is a director of the clinical research at Henry Ford Health System. Uh, she doesn't need much introduction. Uh, she has participated in many a clinical study and has lectured worldwide. Her expertise um, is unsurpassed. It was a great pleasure that I introduce uh, my friend Dr. Linda Steingold for uh, the following presentation. Well, for us, thank you so much. And what a pleasure it is to be here with all of you this evening. I know it's a busy week and a busy night, and I really hope that you gain some clinical pearls from the presentation today. So today I'm really excited to talk about Zareev, which is topical reflumolast cream in the 0.3%. And it's a clear choice for the treatment of plaque psoriasis. I'd like to thank Arcutis for sponsoring this presentation today. This is a promotional program. So as such, we have to be on label, but there is a wealth of information that's included in the package label. And I think you'll get a lot out of really understanding what this particular drug brings to the treatment of our plaque psoriasis patient. So reflumolast or Zareev is indicated for the topical treatment of plaque psoriasis. And when we look at the indication, I wanna show several things that are called out. First of all, not only is it the treatment of plaque psoriasis, but it's absolutely stated that it is appropriate for intertriginous areas. And as you'll see, when we look at the clinical trials, this is a drug that was studied not only for the typical plaques on the skin, but also for those sensitive areas. The next thing is notice it's a cream. So here we have an elegant cream formulation for topical therapy of psoriasis. So you'll see we're able to use a really nice formulation that's cosmetically elegant that also is effective. And then finally, look at the age. We just recently had FDA approval that extended the indication all the way down to age six. So age six and up for those patients with plaque psoriasis. 
looking at the important safety inf information, it is contraindicated in those patients who have severe liver disease. And when we look at the most common adverse reactions that occur in at least 1% of patients, these included diarrhea, headache, insomnia, nausea, application site pain, which is really stinging and burning. Notice that was only 1% upper respiratory tract infection and urinary tract infection. And then please uh, make reference of the full package uh, information to get all of the information on topical reflumolast. So tonight we have a number of different objectives. And the first one is to really look at what is our current topical treatment landscape actually look like? And how has that changed recently compared to our prior many years? Then we'll look to see how topical reflumolast or Zareve makes sense for the treatment of plaque psoriasis. We'll look at the mechanism of action. We'll look at the drug delivery system. And then we'll look at the clinical data, looking at both the efficacy and the safety data that supported the FDA approval. And then finally, we'll take a look and see how this new topical medication can fit into your particular clinical practice. So we'll start off by taking a look at the topical treatment landscape. When we look at all of our psoriasis patients, it turns out that the vast majority of these patients actually have localized disease. And it turns out that about nine out of 10 patients are treated with topical therapy that's either alone or in combination with systemic agents. And we, when we look at the innovation, the research and development in the treatment of psoriasis, there's a disconnect. Although most patients utilize topical therapy, when we look at the research and the new treatment options that have come to market, the vast majority of these have been systemic medications. We've seen new biologic medications, new oral medications, yet we've been really stagnant in terms of topical research and innovation. There was nothing since the, top, the 1990s. And then more recently, within the past few years, we've had two new drugs come to market that have really changed the way we think about the treatment of topical therapy. And that includes a topical phosphodiesterase inhibitor, Zareeb, and also an oral hydrocarbon receptor agonist. Now, when we think about the treatment of plaque psoriasis, we have to realize that our plaque psoriasis patients actually have disease that occurs on many different body parts. We're used to seeing it on the elbows and knees and on the trunk and extremities, but a lot of our patients, actually two thirds of them, have psoriasis in sensitive areas, and that can include the skin folds, the face, the groin. And a lot of the times patients don't necessarily tell you where their psoriasis is. So it's really a nice idea, the very first time you're seeing a psoriasis patient, have them undress and really say, it's not unusual to have psoriasis in private areas and in skin folds. Let's just take a look so we can have a good idea of where your psoriasis is so that we can better treat you as a whole psoriasis patient. Now, when we think about our topical therapy, we have had really significant treatment gaps. In fact, when there was a survey done of plaque psoriasis patients, it turns out that about eight out of 10 of them really were looking for something novel and different from topical corticosteroids. We know if you look online, a lot of patients really have a fear of steroids or they're looking for something that they deem really a more health, healthy approach to the treatment of their psoriasis. Now, as I mentioned, some patients don't tell you where their psoriasis is. 43% of the patients don't tell their physician that they have psoriasis in sensitive areas, but they expect their physician to know. So that means that if we prescribe a medication, for instance, a, a potent topical steroid for their plaque psoriasis, the patients don't know that they shouldn't be using this on the face or in their groin. Nobody told them not to. So it's important to really make sure we understand where patients are using their medications. And about nine out of 10 patients are actually interested in trying something new for their plaque psoriasis. So we need to help simplify the treatment landscape. You know, when I first started out in dermatology, I wanted to be a great dermatologist and my psoriasis patients, I'll give them something for their thick areas, something for their scalp, something for the sensitive areas, something for their face. And what happens is, like so many of our psoriasis patients, they end up with a number of different treatments. 
And I say when they get home with all these different prescriptions, they're pretty much incapacitated by fear because they don't have any idea what you told them when you were in the office. All they know is there's a lot of creams in front of them right now and they don't know what to do. And we've all seen this in the office. We have patients who come in with a bag of medications. Some of them are not open. Some of them are expired. A lot of them are exactly the same things. And patients don't have any idea what medication those, goes where. They do know generally that that potent steroid works pretty well. And that's the thing that they've been using on all their body surface areas. So ideally what we'd like to do is set our patients up for success. Let's simplify the treatment regimen giving patients one medication that is appropriate to be used on multiple body surface areas. Now that's where we come to reflumolas cream. This is the first and only next generation topical phosphodiesterase type 4 inhibitor, and it has a novel delivery system. And we'll talk about why does it make sense to use a PDE4 inhibitor when we're talking about topical treatment of psoriasis. Well, first of all, we have to realize that just as not all steroids are the same, we can have one steroid that's a super potent steroid, one steroid that's a mild potency steroid. Not all PD4 inhibitors are, are the same. Some of them are more potent than others. And this is a next generation topical PD4 inhibitor that's effective, yet it's safe enough to be used on patients age six and up. This is a once daily cream formulation, FDA approved all the way down to age six, and it helps to simplify the treatment regimen. I consider this kind of the yes medication. If somebody says, can I use it on my elbows and knees? Yes. Can I use it maybe just once a day? Yes. Can I use it on my face? Yes. What about in the groin, the sensitive areas? Yes. You can put it pretty much anywhere you need to, one medication, wherever you need to on the body, not on the mucous membranes, but on the skin, and you can, apply it once a day, and it really helps to simplify. Patients can go home with one tube, and they know it's okay to use wherever they have disease. So why would we use a phosphodiesterase type 4 inhibitor for the treatment of psoriasis? And first of all, what in the world is a PDE4 inhibitor? Well, this is an enzyme that is located inside the cell. And the job of phosphodiesterase type 4 is to break down cyclic AMP into AMP. And we know that the ratio of cyclic AMP to AMP helps to control the inflammatory milieu within the cell. So if we can stop the breakdown of cyclic AMP into AMP and create more cyclic AMP within the cell, it actually creates a more anti-inflammatory environment. And it's been shown that we actually see a down regulation of, of those <clears throat> pro-inflammatory cytokines that are associated with psoriasis, like IL-17, IL-23, and TNF-alpha. So this is a molecule or a, a medication that actually works inside the cell to regulate the inflammatory environment. Now, when I think about topical therapy, topical therapy is really the marriage of the active ingredient and the vehicle. And both of these have an important role in the safety, the efficacy, and the tolerability of the drug. Now, sometimes when we use a topical medication, we have to use a vehicle that can be very harsh on the skin because we have to be able to drive that active drug into the skin. With this particular drug in this particular vehicle, they have created a unique delivery system that actually does not disrupt the skin barrier. It does not disrupt the, uh, the proteins and the ceramides. In fact, reflumolast or the active ingredient is lipophilic. It wants to transfer from the medication into the, into the skin and across the lipid matrix. We also know that this is a drug that has a very low molecular weight, so it's easy for the drug to get into the skin, and it has a four-day half-life. So that really supports the use of this medication just once a day. So if we look at this diagram or this schematic where the blue blob is a, uh, is kind of a, a, some medication and the pink shows the skin layer and the corneocytes and the, the lipid matrix, if you look at the yellow molecules of drug, we can see that through this vehicle, which they termed hydroarc technology, the active medications flow almost seamlessly 
from the vehicle and into the skin. And so it doesn't cause um, skin barrier disruption. It actually is a seamless flow of active medication really nicely into the skin itself. So again, when we talk a little bit more about the, the, the vehicle, this is a novel vehicle, it's called Crotophos. It was formulated to make sure it doesn't strip out the ceramides from the skin. It doesn't have propylene glycol, which can be ir irritating. It doesn't have um, isopropyl alcohol or ethanol. There's no fragrances, there's no gluten. It's pH balanced, trying to be the um, consistent with the pH of the stratum corneum. And when you apply this medication to the skin, it actually has a very elegant vehicle. It's not greasy, it spreads very easily, and you'll feel that it absorbs nicely into the skin. This is a unique thought for our topical psoriasis medications because we had thought that we had to use very occlusive ointments in order to get the best penetration of the active medication into the skin, but with this sophisticated vehicle technology, we can actually use an elegant cream formulation and get very, very thorough delivery of the active medication into the skin. So now let's talk a little bit about this medication. Again, it's effective. It can be used anywhere or everywhere, and it's easy, one medication once a day. So I was fortunate to be involved in the, in the clinical trials with reflumalast, and these were done, basically there were two identical sister studies that were conducted. They're the same study, but we have different investigators and in different patients in different sites, and we conduct two different studies, two different phase three studies. They're identical, but they're different because they're different people. And the reason we do this is we want to make sure we have good reproducibility of the data and we can prove that this drug is effective in two phase three studies. For every two patients who were treated with Zorreve or Reflumlast, one patient was treated with the vehicle. And remember, vehicle is not placebo because the vehicle was actually formulated to be very healthy for the skin. We treated these patients every day for eight weeks, so only eight weeks. And we enrolled patients who had mild, moderate, or severe disease based on the investigator's global assessment. So we really have a nice array of different types of patients who came into the study, and they had between two and 20% body surface area. So this is really a great representation of our psoriasis patients. Up to 20%. You know, 10 to 20% is kind of pushing the BSA, but you could treat somebody with 20% body surface area with a topical medication. And the bar for treatment success is a very high bar. Patients have to get all the way to clear or almost clear, but they have to have a two grade improvement. So if people come in with moderate disease, they can improve to clear or almost clear, that's two or three grades, and be a treatment success. If they come in with severe disease, they have to get down to clear or almost clear, but that's a three or a four grade improvement. And if they come in with mild disease, they have to get all the way to clear skin because they need that two grade improvement. So mild to almost clear doesn't count. And it can be very difficult to get completely clear of your psoriasis because even pink skin is not completely clear. So there could be no thickness or scaling, but still pink and they're not completely clear. So it's a very high bar. The other thing that we did in this clinical trial was we looked very specifically at intertriginous disease. Because if you think about it, if you have disease in the sensitive areas or the skin folds, you can't use a potent steroid there. Our options for treatment are very limited. So we wanna see if this non-steroidal option works not only on the plaques of the body, but also on the sensitive areas of the skin folds. And in addition, we looked at the itch reduction, and we asked patients about their very worst itch, and we looked to see how many of these patients had at least a four-point reduction in their worst itch. So the only way to really understand how to interpret clinical trial data is to understand who comes into the study. So we see that the average age was upper 40s, which is very typical for psoriasis patients. It was about two-thirds male, one-third female, about 80% white, but there was a fairly good distribution of other races, about 18% across the board. 
and notice that the, the arms are matched for the active in the vehicle. Now we talked about the fact that psoriasis can affect multiple body surface areas, but I want you to notice that although 72% of patients had psoriasis on their elbows and the majority also on their knees, a high percentage of patients had psoriasis in sensitive areas, 27% on the face, 21% intertriginous, and 16% in the genital area. That means for the vast majority of these patients, they would be getting multiple scripts to treat the multiple body surface areas if they're not using a non-steroidal option such as Zuri. Now on average, the mean BSA was about 7%, and that's pretty typical for a topical psoriasis study. Three quarters of these patients had an itch that was four or greater at baseline, and on average, the mean itch score is a seven. That's actually pretty high, a seven out of 10. Notice that the majority of the patients, about three quarters of them, had moderate disease, 16% had mild, and 8% had severe disease. So these are the patients at baseline. We understand where these patients were when they entered into the study. So now, how did they do? And the primary endpoint was getting patients to clear almost clear. Remember, we're not debreeding the scale, we're not using occlusion, we're not using a heavy ointment. This is a cream formulation applied to their psoriasis anywhere on their body, including the skin folds, once a day over the course of eight weeks. And what we find is we start to see separation, especially after week two, that separation continues in by the end of eight weeks, we saw up to 42% of patients got to clear or almost clear with that two grade improvement. So again, monotherapy, no steroids. We also found that if we allow those patients who went from mild to almost clear, we saw about half the patients got to clear or almost clear. Um, so that's, that's actually quite nice for a topical once daily medication. As I mentioned, we look specifically at the intertriginous areas, which can be so tough to treat. What do you do when somebody has psoriasis in sensitive areas? You might write a low potency steroid. You might try to use one of our non-steroidal options. Here, we look specifically at using Zorreve in the intertriginous areas. And I want you to notice that we started to see nice separation in one study. There was statistical significance by week two. And by the end of eight weeks, we had up to 72% of patients clear or almost clear of their intertriginous disease. And the vast majority of them actually were completely clear. About two thirds of them, or up to two thirds of them, completely clear of their intertriginous disease. So what does that mean? I want you to take a look and you might say, well, does this really work well on those thick plaques? Here's a patient with fairly thick um, psoriasis of the knee. Their investigator's global assessment score at baseline was a moderate. We can see as early as week two, we're starting to see the medication pick in. We see it's now a mild. And as they um, continue over the course of treatment, by week six, they got to an almost clear. And by week eight, they were still an almost clear. And this is an actual clinical trial patient. On the bottom, we see a patient with inframammary disease. They had mild disease at baseline. And by week six, they were completely clear and that continued through week eight. So we, here we see a medication that is tough enough to be used on a thick plaque of the knee, yet gentle enough to be used in the inframammary crease. So let's take a look at some other more difficult to treat areas. You know, these are some areas where we can get some trauma. The shins, where you're constantly putting your elbows down. The heel, where you have the rubbing of the shoes. These can be very difficult to treat. And here we see patients with an elbow, a heel, and a shin at baseline. And each one of these cases, we certainly start to see improvement by week two. And for all of these, we have treatment success um, actually by week eight. And in two of the cases, um, even by week six or by week four even. So this is a medication you can see, at least in these cases, a visible change definitely within the first two weeks. So I know we all love pictures, so let's take a look now at some more pictures of sensitive areas and intertriginous areas. The first gentleman with the disease on the neck, we can see how irritated and red that is. The second one under the arm, again, a difficult area, and the third one also in the axilla. We start to see within two weeks, definitely a decrease in redness and a decrease in thickness. And that difference continues. And all of these patients were a treatment success by the end of 
um, actually six weeks. In, in this case, in, at six weeks, they were all clear. And the one on the neck, he had a little bit come back in one area, so he was an almost clear. But we see a fairly rapid onset of action. And we don't see a lot of irritation in the clinical photographs, even at week two. Now, this is a really interesting picture. And sometimes I like to look at the patients who did not meet treatment success. Here's a patient who had a very thick lesion on the knee, and here's an area on the hand. This patient had severe disease at baseline. And when we look at week eight, notice the knee went from that big, thick, large plaque to that very small, thinner plaque. And notice on the hands, this guy at baseline probably would not be comfortable walking into a room, reaching out his hand to shake hands with people, whereas week eight, he probably would be. But what I also love is look at how he looks tan at week eight. This tells me that he was confident enough, even though he didn't get to clear, almost clear, to wear shorts. This is potentially life-changing, even in a patient who technically, by the criteria of the clinical trial, was a treatment failure. So what about itch? We mentioned that patients were itchy at baseline. They had an average of a seven out of 10 of their worst itch. Again, we start to see separation as early as week two. And I want you to notice that each one of these studies called Dermis 1 and Dermis 2 almost look like mirror images of each other. We see good reproducible data in each one of the efficacy assessments that is studied. So here looking at um, itch and how many of these patients had a four point reduction in their worst itch, we see up to 68% of patients at week eight had that four point reduction, but we also see it kicked in pretty quickly. We also found that there was itch-related sleep loss also improved in patients um, as was found in the phase two clinical trials. Okay, what about side effects? And this is important. Um, the side effects that occurred more commonly in Zareve as compared to vehicle in at least 1% were diarrhea, headache, insomnia, nausea, application site pain, which means stinging and burning, upper respiratory tract infection, and urinary tract infection. I do wanna call out the diarrhea. Notice that there were 18 patients who experienced diarrhea in the clinical trials, but 17 out of 18 had mild, usually within the first two weeks. And for a lot of these patients, it just continued, um, it, they continued on therapy without any treatment and it resolved on its own. Um, none of the patients had to interrupt their treatment due to diarrhea. I also wanna point out that with Soreev, there was no associated folliculitis. There is no atrophy, no striae, no HP axis suppression. It's well tolerated, and the discontinuation rate due to any adverse event was about 1%. So, this is a drug, the non steroidal option, but we actually find very good tolerability here. So, let's look a little bit more about tolerability because when we think about non steroidal options, whether we're treating psoriasis or treating atopic dermatitis, we have come to understand that often non steroidal agents can have some stinging and burning. And we often have to hold our patient's hands and say, look, there is a trade off. If you want to use something that's not a steroid, you're going to have to suffer through a little bit because of stinging and burning. Yet when we look at Zareev and look at the tolerability, the first um, analysis is the investigated, investigator rated local tolerability. They're looking at the patients and looking for signs of irritation. And the second one is the patient-related tolerability, talking about um, feeling hot or tingling or burning sensation. And notice these numbers are very, very low. And in fact, according to the patient, they're very, very low. So here we are with these, um, with these studies. So basically, it was favorable tolerability regardless of the area that was studied. Remember, we studied some of our patients who had um, psoriasis in sensitive areas and the tolerability was favorable no matter where they were putting it. Only less than half a percent, only two out of 200, uh, out of 562 patients had any type of tingling, burning, or heat sensation with the first application. And um, basically overall, this is a drug that was very well tolerated. Well, we did do a long-term study and the importance of a long-term study is to realize that you know, psoriasis doesn't exist for only eight weeks. What happens if we have access to the medication for longer periods of time? 
So there was a long-term phase two study where patients had access to the medication um, over the course of at least a year. And what we found was 97% of, of the adverse reactions were unrelated or unlikely to be related, related to the drug. 94% of them were mild or moderate. And basically less than 1% of patients discontinued due to any lack of efficacy and under 4% discontinued due to any adverse event. And when we look at the adverse events that occurred over time, basically the bottom line was we did not identify any type of new safety signals with using this medication over a long period of time that we did not see in the short-term trials. So what happens in the long-term study where patients had access to the medication on and off over the course of from week four up through uh, week 52. And what we found was we had a sustained efficacy in getting and um, sustained clear or almost clear over the course of time. We can see that as patients went on and off drug, as they got to clear or almost clear, they went might have gone or got to clear, they went off drug, went, then went back on drug. We didn't see any tachyphylaxis occurring. Basically, as you continue to use the medication, you continue to see success over the course of time. So how would you, would you integrate this medication into your psoriasis practice? Where does it actually fit? And if you think about it, first of all, this is a medication that has been FDA approved all the way down to age six. It's appropriate for patients with plaque psoriasis, but they can have mild, moderate, or severe disease they can have it in any location. So this is a medication that is appropriate for any patient who needs topical treatment. And who does this include? Well, you might consider this for patients who are concerned about using topical steroids, for patients who have been on steroids for a while and need a break, or for those patients who need an alternative treatment. Think about this for patients who you give a lot of medications to. These patients who walk out with two or three prescriptions to treat their psoriasis, multiple treatment users, you know, you're giving them one thing for one area, one thing for another area, help them be set up for success, simplify the treatment regimen with one medication that can be used in multiple body surface areas. And then there are those patients who have tried a lot of different medicines, which call them the topical cyclers. They go through all different types of things. They're really not satisfied and looking for something else. And what are we going to do for those kids? We have psoriasis patients that are children. I definitely have psoriasis patients that are age six and up, always looking for something else <clears throat> that is safe and effective. And now we have that indication all the way down to age six months. There are some patients and there are patients in the clinical trials who had between 10 and 20% body surface area. By definition, they were candidates for systemic therapy, but some patients might not be ready for a systemic agent. So maybe they're in that 10 to 20% BSA range and they might want to try something else topically. This has been studied in that body surface area and shown to be successful. And then those patients who tend to have uh, flares, they break through with their, their topical treatment and they're looking for something else and something that eases the itch associated with psoriasis. So there are a lot of patients, in my mind, I think um, topical reflumolast is appropriate for any patient who needs topical therapy regardless of where their disease lies. Now it's one thing to have a new medication, it's quite another thing to have access of that medication for our patients. And our cutis has spent a lot of time trying to make sure that patients have access to the medications that we need. They now have realized broad coverage with more than 80% of commercial lives covered. They have a number of patient assistant programs in place, including Zareve Direct, or patients with commercial insurance might pay as little as $25, and then Arcutus Cares, which is a patient assistant program for underinsured or uninsured patients, and you can certainly ask your representatives about that. <clears throat> so what did we learn today? Basically, topical reflumolase cream, or Zareev, is the first and the only next-generation topical phosphodiesterase inhibitor that's FDA-approved for plaque psoriasis in patients who are age six and up, it's once a day, it's an elegant cream formulation, it is not a steroid, and it has the power to clear those thick plaques of the elbows and knees 
but also the gentle areas, including the face, the skin folds, and the groin. We can use it and see fairly rapid relief starting as early as two or four weeks. It's well tolerated. It's safe to be used anywhere, and it can be used for any duration. There is not a limitation that's in the, uh, the uh, package insert. It has not been associated with folliculitis, atrophy, or striae. No uh, association with HPA axis suppression. When we looked at tolerability issues, less than less less than one percent. About three out of 562 patients had any stinging or burning, and this was formulated <laughs> with a vehicle that helps to actually not disrupt the skin barrier and no propylene glycol. So. We do value your feedback. Please go ahead and scan the QR code and um, give us some feedback about your virtual experience this evening. And thank you so much. And I, I do believe we have plenty of time uh, for questions. So if you want to submit a question, remember, submit your questions in the question chat pane on the right-hand side of the screen. And if ever you think of any questions after the webinar, you can always email them to info at idfeducationalseries.com. Linda, what a great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question. Um, you know, we see the data and, and the lack of, of stinging and burning with it. Um, and I know you, you've been, uh, you participate in the trials, but you also see patients. Have you seen any burning in real life when you use it on your patients? You know, for us, it's such an important question because I've been involved with a number of clinical trials. And as you know, sometimes when we look at the clinical trial data, we see very low numbers for things like stinging and burning. Yet when we try them in actual life, um, we see a lot of stinging and burning. And I think we've experienced this with the other non-steroidal agents. But I'll tell you, as a clinical investigator and then somebody who actually sees uh, regular, re regular clinic patients, I haven't seen it. That doesn't mean it can't occur because we know in a, you know 1% or so they might have some stinging and burning. So it's not in everybody that they won't have it. But in my experience, I really haven't seen it. And I have used it in sensitive areas. So I was happy to see that I didn't have to have a long conversation with them about you know, what to expect because it's, it's fairly easy to use. Uh, my experience is very similar. I have not seen, I have not seen stinging or burning yet um, with, this, uh, with this drug. And I think it, it says a lot about the, the excipients that are in the drug um, in it as well. Um, one of the things that, that also comes up, you know, my patients ask me that uh, often, what happens uh, when the plaque clears? Do we keep on going? Do we stop? What do we do with that? Yeah, and that's, that's really an important question. And, you know, you can go back to the way the clinical trials were designed because they actually asked this question. You know, what was nice about in the long-term studies, patients could go on and off drug kind of as needed. And every long-term study is conducted a little bit differently. You know, sometimes we take the medication away when they get to clear, almost clear. Um, in this case, we really didn't. We allowed patients to have the medication and they could treat until their, their lesion got completely clear. But if they got disease back somewhere else, they could go ahead and use it again. So patients had access of their, to their medication and used it really as needed. So I do this too. I really wanna make sure if they're gonna stop treating an area, I want it to be completely clear. I usually tell them, treat until it's clear, treat maybe another few days. And then if you want to stop, you can stop. But then I'd say, if it starts to come back, go ahead and start it again. What we, excuse me, what we don't have data for is any type of maintenance therapy using it a few times a week. We don't have any data on that. All we have data on at this point is use it until clear, and then you can go ahead and start using it again as necessary. And in my patients, I think a lot of them do end up having a holiday, at least a holiday for treating a lot of their lesions, and then they just spot treat as needed. And one of my experience, and actually it's been experienced that with many of the topicals we have used in the past, you know, many of them when we did the study, when the studies were done, excluded knees and elbows, because these are the harder plaques, um, the harder plaques to treat. Um, I, they were included in the study and the results were impressive in the study. I'm going to ask you the same question about this as I did about the stinging and burning. What has your experience been 
with the use of this this drug as monotherapy on these hard to treat areas. Yeah, you know, Frost, you bring up such an interesting point because <clears throat> I do remember doing studies where they did exclude the thick areas because they didn't want to have their numbers go down. <laughs> it's a lot easier to treat a thin plaque, you know, on the trunk than a really thick plaque on the elbow or knees that continue to get traumatized. But I do find that, you know, I see results even in these thick areas. But this is a medication, you know, you're not going to put it on and then, you know, three days later the plaque's gone. It takes a little bit of time, you know, and I tell patients that this is not a Band-Aid. This is a medication that goes in and it works inside the how the cell trying to reprogram the inflammatory environment within the cell and um and it's doing it i think in in a uh, in a fairly healthy way so you know I, I see it i say don't don't look overnight but look you know within the first few weeks you should definitely see thinning of the plaque decrease of the scaling even decrease of the redness good and that, that's been my experience as well really has done well both in the in the thicker areas that we usually don't see respond very well and also in the traditionist areas which are very you know they're special they don't they don't behave the same way i feel as as your regular black psoriasis um i'm looking at the chat and the question box it doesn't seem that anybody has um questions submitted which which speaks uh, about the clarity of your presentation um mm -hmm. i think uh, unless anybody has questions that show up that want to they want to submit I think we had a great presentation, and um, Roxanne, if you would like to add something something else. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much to everybody for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Linda Steingold, for such a great presentation on a fabulous options for patients with plaque psoriasis, and Dr. Ujir, always, thank you so much for great moderation. So join us next week for another International Dermatology Education Foundation webinar. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Bye.